actually, uh, I have a, a really quick announcement to make, which, uh, and that is uh, we have a live feed uh, out in the long gallery just outside in the event that uh, you feel entirely crushed and claustrophobic in here, you could, uh, God, this is loud. Um, uh, you, can, uh, you could move out there. I, I don't suspect we'll have a, a crush to move out there, but in the event that you would like to move out there, uh, this might be a good time. Um, well, welcome to, to SciArc, for those of you who aren't uh, from inside the building. Uh, we're really, really happy and feel very fortunate uh, tonight to have uh, this panel uh, up here. I have the uh, fortunate or unfortunate uh, job of moderating what I suspect will be uh, an immoderate uh, bunch of people. Um, but we'll see about that. Um, I want to uh, thank the, uh, the student lecture committee who put together this panel, but also who put together all the lectures uh, for the year. I think they've done a terrific job, and, and this is an especially good one. Uh, there are a couple of other quick announcements. Uh, one is that Peter Cook's lecture uh, will be November 17th at 7.30. It's not on the poster, but it will be on uh, November 17th at 7.30. It's entitled Passing Through Super Houston Towards Avignon. Uh, he'll be visiting SciArc uh, for several days with a group of Bartlett tutors and students. Uh, I, I also want to announce that there will be a reception in the undergraduate gallery following uh, the panel discussion for Hybrid Space. Uh, it's a book published uh, by Rizzoli, uh, and it's edited by our own uh, Peter Zellner. So it's uh, right out in the undergraduate gallery. Um, no applause uh, yet for Peter. <laughs> yeah, I want to uh, just give a, a, just a quick word about the format for the discussion. Uh, each presenter uh, uh, will have 15 minutes to make uh, a presentation. After each uh, has presented, uh, we'll have an open discussion, uh, which, uh, which I'm going to attempt to moderate. Um, the speakers will appear in the order of, uh, of introduction, uh, of the order in which I introduce them uh, in just a moment. But first, I, I want to give maybe a, a few quick uh, uh, um, words about an explanation for the title of the series and, 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 and make some guesses. Um, and I'm going to read. It's just going to be, it won't be long, I promise. It's hot in here. Um, following Corb uh, and Jeffrey Kipnis, uh, two auspicious uh, authors, uh, both of whom uh, had penned an essay entitled Towards a New Architecture, a number of students on the lecture committee had the, had the intuition that something connected our speakers beyond the fact that they all share an interest in the work of French philosopher Gilles Deleuze and that Sanford Quinter, in several articles in the any publishing world, had identified them as a group. Indeed, in an aborted manifesto given or delivered uh, more than two years ago in Rotterdam, Quinter identified them and himself as an emergent avant-garde, restless with the process-based work of their forebears, uh, namely Peter Eisenman, and ready to get on with it. This is what Quinter wrote. The late 20th century may one day be known as the dawn of the algorithm. If so, we wish to be the first to embrace the new rationality that sees space and matter as indistinguishable, as active mediums shaped by both embedded and remote events and the patterns they form. For us, the new design envelope is an organon in the making. It is comprised of a will to technique and an ethos of research. Now, Quinter's eloquent speech certainly resonates with the work, or m with much of the work we'll see tonight. But the student's intuition, I suspect, had more to do with an insight gleaned from a close reading of Kipnis's essay, Towards a New Architecture. There, reversing the polarity of the decorated shed duck distinction made by Venturi, Scott Brown, and Isenor in Learning from Las Vegas, Kipnis draws a distinction between what he calls information and deformation. His own interests were in deformation, a kind of experimental architectural practice concerned with, among other things, developing new forms that no longer labor under the postmodern or deconstructivist necessity to represent. Kipnis is, is one of the first calls for a post-semiotic, post-representational architecture. It is this interest in post-representational form, I think, that connects all of these offices. 
UN Studio has for some time been fascinated with the diagram and with what they now call spin and the network, while Greg Lynn and Carl Chu have sought a more abstract design protocol in computational and animation strategies, both of which are decidedly not representational. Kipnis was early uh, on interested in Eisenman's weak form and later developed with Baram Shurdel what he called, that is what Kipnis called, black stuff, a kind of abstract, almost non-representational form. Kipnis' current interests uh, in affect and in architectural sensibility stem from uh, this work, I suspect, on black stuff, although I'm not sure. So there are a number of things that connect these panelists. They, are, they all know each other. They share some enemies uh, and many friends. Now, I hope we all are among the latter, but in the, but in the event that we're not, I should warn you all on the panel that we're perfectly well prepared for either an episode of Donahue or Geraldo. Uh, <laughs> now, I, I want to introduce uh, all of the panelists, uh, and they will uh, give their presentations in the order uh, that I present them. Um, Carl Chu is going to go first, Ben Van Berkel and Caroline, uh, Caroline Boss is go are going to go next. Greg Lynn will go third, and uh, Jeff is going to go last. Jeff Kipnis is going to go last. Uh, Carl Chu received his Master's of Architecture from Cranbrook Academy of Art and is a principal of the firm uh, Excavia in Los Angeles. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right, but um, in any case. His electronic manipulations have been exhibited at UCLA in genetic space and published widely in AD Magazine and Any Magazine. He has lectured and taught at the Technical University of Vienna, University of Houston, and the Department of Architecture at Anhuac University. Uh, and is in addition, uh, and for us, uh, we're very happy, uh, is uh, a SciArc uh, faculty where he teaches design studio and advanced drawing. Um, ben Van Berkel and Caroline, uh, Caroline Boss, uh, uh, new office uh, is uh, entitled uh, Studio UN or UN Studio. I never get that right. but. Um, Ben graduated from the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam in 1982 and from the Architectural Association in London in 1987. After practical experience in the offices of Santiago Calatrava and Zaha Hadid, he started with art historian Caroline Boss, uh, a 1989 graduate of the University of London, an office uh, in 1988, which this past year was renamed UN Studio. They're the authors uh, of an incredible uh, new architectural tome uh, entitled Move, published this year by their own office and Goose Press. Uh, they have many buildings to their credit, credit inclu including the Carbao and ACOM buildings, the REMU electricity station, several housing projects, and more recently the famous Mobius House, which is now featured in the unprivate uh, house show at MoMA. Uh, they're perhaps best known for, uh, as the designers of the uh, spectacular Erasmus Bridge uh, in Rotterdam. Um, Greg Lynn. Uh, Greg graduated from Miami University in Ohio in 1986 with two degrees, one in philosophy and the other environmental design. He graduated from Princeton University with a master's in architecture in 1988. He's worked in the offices of Peter Eisenman, Antoine Predock. Uh, Greg has taught throughout the U.S. and Europe and is presently a, a full-time adjunct assistant professor at Columbia. Uh, and he's a professor at UCLA and the ETH in Zurich. His office, a Greg Lynn Form, uh, in collaboration with Michael McIntyre for Architects and Douglas Garofalo, recently completed the Korean Presbyterian Church in New York uh, in Queens. Uh, Jeffrey Kipnis uh, uh, was recently named the Curator of Architecture at the Wexner Center for Arts uh, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. He's a professor at the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State. He's visiting professor of architecture at Columbia University. He is the author of innumerable articles, books, and interventions. And for this and many other reasons has been called the Gideon uh, of the current generation uh, of architects, something that he will no doubt rise to challenge uh, during the discussion. Um, so the, so the format is that uh, we will begin with Carl's presentation. Uh, we hope, uh, we pray, that they will only go 15 minutes apiece. Um, uh, if they don't, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that they do. Um, 
after the presentations, uh, we're going to have a, a, a hopefully an open discussion. I'm going to have a mic and I'm going to wander around uh, like Donahue in the audience uh, and see if you all will uh, engage this spectacular uh, group of uh, contemporary architects and thinkers. So without uh, taking up any more time in the heat, uh, I'm going to give it over to Carl Chu. Carl's going to present. Uh, then uh, Ben, then Greg, uh, and then Jeff is going to wrap it up and we'll have a discussion. Thank you. Hello, testing. All right, I'm going to s uh, stand up and speak. It's, uh, it's quite fitting that uh, I'm the first to go, uh, not because that uh, you know, I'm a, r a resident here too, but what I'd like to talk about is going to have uh, a lot of implications about, I think, uh, what we're going to be uh, discussing today. Now, uh, I'm, going, I'm interested in genetic architecture. And I feel that, uh, you know, with a few months away from the uh, end of the millennium, we are, in fact, moving towards a new, you know, uh, radical transformation of, uh, not only of architecture, but, in fact, of our, of our conception of reality. And this may seem a lot uh, that I'm claiming, but let me say that uh, you know, with the advent of computers, which uh, happened in 1936, Alan Turing wrote a paper in 1936, which specifies what, is, what has now come to be known as a Turing machine. And in fact, the advent of the Turing machine is not just merely another technical invention. As far as I'm concerned, if I may sort of exaggerate a little bit, it is a bifurcation point in the history of uh, you know, human civilization, which means that uh, from that moment on, we are sort of developing an, a, an equivalent and parallel sort of evolutionary system so that the Turing machine is not just merely a calculator, but it is in fact a genetic evolutionary abstract machine. And one of the most famous uh, theory with regard to computation is that uh, it's called the Church-Turing thesis, which says that anything that is computable can be computed by the universal Turing machine. And it may not seem too much, or, you know, or, uh, it may not seem uh, to me much at all, but in fact, that's an amazing thesis, and it's quite provocative, and a number of uh, perhaps uh, uh, participants on the panel may um, uh, disagree with this principle, but I think that it is potentially quite true. Oh, I see, I'm, I'm pointing in the right, wrong direction. And basically, uh, what it means is that uh, the Turing machine can compute anything that is physically computable, and that ultimately, it's going to create its own sort of a parallel universe, and that architecture will ultimately be transformed by this uh, phenomena called the Turing machine. And incidentally, all the uh, computers that we use nowadays is basically sort of predicated, or at, at least they are based on the conceptual blueprint of the Turing machine. And if you look at the, uh, the slide on the left, it says that there exists an abstract universal computer whose repertoire includes any computation that any physically possible object can perform. And then a stronger version of, of the same information on the right, it says that it is possible to build a virtual reality generator whose repertoire includes every physically possible environment, which means that the Turing machine can calculate and compute and come up with an equivalent, equivalent model of anything that is you know, uh, produced or evolved, that can be evolved within the universe. And my own work is uh, predicated on a theory of architecture based on computation. And I feel that there are a lot of people who use computation, but I felt that uh, there's no sort of adequate theory of architecture based on you know, the logic of computation. And computation at bottom is nothing but uh, a system of combination. So I develop uh, uh, a primitive uh, monadic systems based on the logic of com computing, uh, com combining three basic elements. And this is what you get. But before I get into that, what I'd like to do is to give you a set of suppositions about uh, a computational version of monodology. And uh, my feeling is that uh, a Turing machine is a logical counterpart of you know, uh, Leibniz's concept of the, uh, of, of the monad. And I'm a little hesitant to talk about these things because even though I plan my lecture uh, to discuss these esoteric issues, I'm, it may be a little bit too uh, serious. But nevertheless, uh, I believe that uh, the future of architecture lies greatly in the development of a monadic architecture, one that is based on and founded upon the, 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 uh, the, the theoretical implications of the uh, Turing machine. 
Now, uh, can I have those images um, of the text, Davis? And there are three basic premises or principles that governs an evolutionary notion about the universe. And the first one says that uh, it evolves and develop out of the principle of generative condensation. Basically, things are uh, develop and evolve recursively. And the second one is based on the principle of combinatorial expansion, which means that things recursively, recursively replicate and uh, build up a, an aggregation, and then which further develop and emerge into uh, you know, complex morphology. And then the third principle is essentially the principle of, co of conservation of information, which has to do with the development and construction of a universal history for each monad. And uh, I have reduced 21 propositions from Leibniz's uh, monadology, which contains something like 20 or 90 propositions. Can we sc 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 scroll it down? Uh, the first one, it says that a monad is a singularity and an omega point out of which it recursively expands and contracts to form the cone of imminent sentence. Two, each monad through its projection is an incomplete totality, an emergent phenomena that constitutes its own self-contained universe. Every monad is an evolutionary system that dynamically emerges out of an undifferentiated precondition laden with pure potentiality. Four, the cone of imminent sentence is a projection out of each monad that condenses and evolves into modes and attributes. Five, the set of initial conditions determines the range and scope as well as the nature of modes and attributes of each monad. <clears throat> Six, modes are primitive agents or microautomatas that through the through the aggregation of functions and the interactions engender a virtual ecology specific to each monad. <clears throat> Seven, each monad acquires an idea in itself through an, through an internal principle which is constrained by the logic and limits of the Turing principle. Eight, monads are transfinite complexions they are quantitatively simple, but qualitatively complex. <laughs> Every monad is an emergent species that self-organizes into a complex web of scalar and specification regimes of nested hierarchies. <laughs> By the way, uh, if you can substitute the monad with the Turing machine, I think it, it will do just fine. Each monad is an each monad is endowed with the principle of sufficient reason, which in turn is an extension of an attribute of universal reason or logos. 11. Every monad has a point of view derived from the synthesis of multiple points of views, a model of multiplicity and unity. Each monad engenders an internal model or perception of the world, and each is a mirror or reflection of every other monad. 13. Composability is a function of coordination governed by the axiom of constructability and further constrained by the logic of the Turing principle. Fourteen. The degree of order and random information present within each monad determines the complexity of the minimal string necessary for computation and subsequent evolution into higher levels of monadic self-organization. Monads are modal entities that participate within the context of a unique set of possible worlds. The sum, total, the sum totality of monads together form a universal monad, which is an incomplete but virtual totality. The collective web of nonlinear mappings of computational monads generates a universal Turing surface, forming the wall sheet of the universal monad as the surface of the one all. Eighteen. 
The universal Turing surface is the epigenetic landscape that maps the becoming actual of the universal re history of a, of a universal monad. A universal monad is a demiagic expression of a species of possible world out of an infinite number of possible worlds. The emergence of critical self-consciousness out of the omega point further propels each monad towards the sphere of omniscience, which is indicative of the messianic moment that, is, that still awaits for the fulfillment of architecture. And lastly, architecture is a provisional onto-organology, a mapping of the states of monadic self-organizations onto the wall sheet based on an ethics founded upon metaphysics. And so basically what I'm trying to do is to develop a theoretical proposition that, uh, you know, uh, that I can use to generate, for, at least for me, a new kind of evolutionary architecture. And the images that you see on the right is, are uh, essentially experiments of what I would essentially call a very primitive form of um, monad based on the L systems. L system is essentially a type of branching system uh, invented by a Swedish biologist by the name of Astrid Lindemeyer. And it's, it is a branching system, and I've developed these combinatorial relationships, relationships and mappings to generate these uh, images. And for me, they are proto-architecture, even though they are not quite buildings yet. I have every intention to develop and evolve them into buildings so that perhaps one of these days we can literally grow uh, buildings within the computational environment. And uh, this, is, this kind of des approach to design is quite different from the architect playing uh, you know, the sole author. In fact, I set up a set of system, and then the system produced these configurations. And the fact that they look like plants and quasi-biological sort of our, you know, forms is really a product of the type of mapping system that I use. I have no sort of a initial set of a predilection as to what the final outcomes is going to be. It develop and evolve over, as the project grows over time. So my basic premise is that the Turing principle, the Turing machine, is an evolutionary system. That it is an intrinsic part of the universe, and that uh, in the future uh, it's going to permeate both into the landscape of the physical world outside as well as into the biological systems of our own body so that we will not be able to tell in terms of who, what, when, or you know, what things are happening. So that the notion of subjectivity and identity itself is called into question. And ultimately, I think it's, um, it's terrifying. At the same time, it can be quite wonderful. So I think it's a very complex set of uh, proposition that uh, Alan Turing has made uh, in 1936. Thank you very much. So yeah, next uh, will be uh, Ben and Carolee. Yeah? Do you want to go here, Ben? And your uh, laser. Thanks very much. Um, I hope to be as compact. Um, I would like to uh, uh, focus on uh, the rethinking of organizational structures in the sense that, that if we um, look at new techniques, new uh, understandings of uh, computational techniques, uh, 
uh, or diagram techniques uh, that that we more or less are uh, focusing these techniques on on yeah the organizational principles. Uh, and the first two slides are saying something about uh, new techniques in the sense that on the right slide you see how in medical science today we can uh, map the most amazing uh, uh, aspects of the body. Uh, and if you compare medical science towards architecture then, or in relationship with architecture, then, then you could say that we are a, a, a little bit behind in the sense of, of uh, new techniques. Um, and in a way, how new techniques could be replied to, uh, let's call it the new concept of the architect, uh, it would be not so um, uh, unpleasant to be the architect of the future, if you might see in this uh, picture on the left, uh, in the sense that you might work on your own, but you might, might uh, work uh, in different relationships and on different levels with others together in other places where you are having no kind of uh, uh, direct uh, physical relationship with. So, next two slides. Um, this whole aspect of the rethinking of organizational structures comes in a work uh, back in the way how we have analyzed um, uh, organizational principles in earlier te techniques used before. Where, for instance, in, um, in the Villa Savoie, you can ver ver totally clearly see how a column organization, a plan, uh, a wall system are all separate entities. Uh, and in the relationship with earlier uh, collage techniques uh, and maybe later, uh, um, yeah, you could call it the blur techniques, uh, the, the displacements of the organization are connected uh, in a particular way. But what is quite incredible with uh, computational techniques today is that you can uh, generate these images uh, whereby, let's say, the information of a man, a snake here, and a line are combined in a manimal, but you can't see the seams. And we believe that, and it's maybe difficult to see in this image down here, that, that seamless organizations, hybrid organizations, could be, um, be thought as, as organizational principles who could take up a lot of differential qualities of architectural ingredients we have been uh, working with before. So if we are looking at these techniques uh, and at these organizations, then the incoherence of the collage and the coherent uh, qualities of the, the hybrid, hybridization techniques of mediation techniques could be used in, in organizational principles as well. Next to. Um, and if we could say that, that before we worked with oppositional strategies where infrastructure and built form were uh, seen to be dialectical uh, oppos oppositional uh, systems, how could it be today that we could look at more uh, relational organizations where different values come together? And specifically today with uh, computational techniques we can map time in a much more easier uh, way than, than we could uh, do before. Um, and time versus uh, uh, built structures or versus uh, uh, program could be hybridized in, in far more rich and relational uh, ways than, than we could do before. For instance, in this image, maybe you could focus this one. Uh, in this image, you could see, uh, this was an uh, earlier uh, study for a site we uh, worked on uh, close to the Penn Station uh, in Manhattan, is that around the Grand Central Station in this conceptual section through Manhattan, uh, an enormous peak of people, uh, of half a million people uh, coming uh, through the station each day the amount of program uh, uh, and infrastructure supplies around this package of uh, organizational systems here is, is in its re relational quality uh, uh, really uh, strongly uh, uh, organized in such a way that it ha each system hangs on, on the other system. Whereas if you see uh, and look at the Penn Station related to the empty side we, we studied, there is a similar peak of people coming to the site, but there is no strong relational quality of other programs or infrastructure supplying this part of the site next to. In, in, an, um, in a project we started up uh, two or three years ago, we studied these kind of uh, aspects of relational, infrastructural, programmatic and public spaces uh, in such a way that over the day we looked to the groupings 
of uh, how there were in the site we could see where empty uh, spaces could be compartmentalized in, in a different order whereby we didn't separate program from infrastructure but spe especially here where you have two bus stations, a regional bus station and a local bus station and a train station we tried to look how uh, quick movement and slow movement on the site could be related to quick program and quick uh, uh, infrastructural relationships between the programs towards where there, were, where there was slow movement towards slow program. So there where you have actually housing and offices, they're more stretched out of the site and in the middle you have more this uh, quicker program. Um, next two. Um, if, if you look at uh, um, the project again, uh, what we did for the ICCA, uh, the, the Manhattan site, as I showed you before, is that there again we, we push these uh, aspects of time-based programmatic aspects of the way how certain parts of the city are used. For instance, in, uh, in the whole of Manhattan, we, we studied over the day how, let's say, leisure, uh, pr uh, commercial program, office program, industrial uh, 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 programs could be related in not only in the way how, let's say, the site uh, was uh, occupied or the different parts of the site could be occupied during the day, but also during the week. And this, what we call the critical package of all these uh, relational uh, qualities were studied in the way how in uh, an almost seven dimensional uh, diagram uh, where accessibility uh, and time could be grouped towards the publicness of the site. So we use these diagrams or these diagram techniques in order to study accessibility and the duration of program. So new techniques are not giving us new visual attractive uh, uh, levels of information but they start to give you uh, possible ways of uh, rethinking or deeper values we work with uh, in architecture uh, for instance in this diagram you can clearly see that certain programs here like housing are uh, less accessible and durationally differently used than other uh, for instance more uh, public uh, programs next to um, yeah, and this, uh, may, you cannot read it, but uh, it says here, oh, if only it were so simple. Um, using these uh, 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 diagrams, is, I mean, maybe on the one hand you could say, yeah, are they really necessary to, to be so complicated as they look like? But they, they are, in a way, how you group them and how you relate them to each other are not as difficult as maybe a Borromini did his stereotypic uh, 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 drawings. Uh, in the time, maybe in the, in the Baroque period, ne nobody understood his drawings. But he could do the most incredible uh, spatial uh, uh, projects with that. Um, so uh, again, the grouping of values and the grouping of relational techniques, uh, and that's what I would like to emphasize as well, is that, that we not only use computational techniques, we, we use manual techniques and also model techniques to, 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 to relate them towards each other and group values in a way almost as a mountain climber uh, goes towards his goal with uh, attached to him other uh, set of mountain climbers and groups himself towards the way how he uh, gets his uh, 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 position. Yeah, next to Next to So maybe Mm, to be more clear, I would like to uh, uh, show uh, this project where the similar aspect of time, program, uh, construction, uh, the, the durational aspect of the way how program was mixed uh, in this structure were all kind of squeezed into one system. Um, so coming back to the minimal uh, I showed before, it is here so that you have one spring-like structure, but actually uh, vol in volume takes up uh, this program for a theater, a music theater in Graz. Uh, and it actually, uh, uh, it starts uh, with, with uh, the major functions towards uh, the, the large music center uh, at the center of uh, the building in this uh, linear system of the way how the client wanted to group his program. But we said that that this space needed to have uh, an, 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 an 
yeah, a set of uh, interrelational qualities because uh, the density of the program was so uh, tight for the site that, that he not only programmed, but also the way how you would move through the system uh, could be squeezed into each other so that uh, one line, one, one coherent system would take up all the architectural ingredients like program, like construction uh, into one system. So, so one, one part of the, the space hangs into the other space in order to, uh, to be part of the, the whole organization. Next to. You see maybe better here how that works. So the spring structure hangs into the major spring structure at the end of the building. So um, again, there are no columns here. There are no the walls become floor, floor become uh, ceilings. And they, they hold each other up in, in one system. Next to. And this aspect of uh, relational techniques, relational uh, uh, values we group in, in our projects, uh, maybe in this new coherent organizations, like maybe in the recent uh, Möbius house, we are, we are not only interested in the organizational effect or the organizational principle and, and the way how the, our, these uh, effects are generated by these new techniques, but we are specifically also if interested in the relational uh, quality of this effect, whereby Maybe, uh, maybe referring back to the face, that where the black hole in the face or the white wall of the of, of the face could be um, could be squeezed and, and twisted and be a more more and, and rethought in its organization, uh, but where the face then becomes more uh, a rich machine, a more complex machine, where the music line, the pictorial line, and the landscape line. And the passion line could be all red in this phase. So whenever you work with a service or with a coherent organization of a service or in the case of the Kratz Theater with a line, then we are interested in all these layers of the way how the, the richness of these uh, 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 structures could uh, generate their effects. Next to. Yeah, I know I really would like to uh, end with uh, saying that that it is the shifting of engineering and architecture, uh, the shifting of uh, public life and maybe you could say public constructions who are part of these uh, uh, layers of techniques we are, are interested in. Uh, and maybe it's a new attitude towards the way how we are interested in synchronic uh, utilit utilities. Next. Yeah, thank you. Glenn is next. Although, uh, Michael, you gave an incredible introduction, there was one similarity you left out, which is that two years ago at a conference in Rotterdam, Winnie Moss said that all of the people on this panel, plus uh, foreign office architects and Riser Umamoto, were involved in a neo Art Nouveau movement. And I think Winnie felt that that was a damning damning condemnation, and I actually thought it was a, a very interesting proposal. So tonight, I thought I might just pull out a few of the Art Nouveau themes in terms of tectonics and uh, spatial effects that might hold all of us together. Um, first, I'd want to just say that Gideon and Pevsner included the Art Nouveau within uh, language of modern architecture for two principles at least. The first was that the Art Nouveau moved away from the classical orders towards an abstraction of nature. In the Vienna school, a kind of reptilian surface, and in the Brussels school, uh, the vegetal frame. And he all, they both also included uh, the Art Nouveau within modern architecture for its focus on new technologies of fabrication and construction. Now, I think maybe uh, some of those themes have already come up on the panel, they excluded the Art Nouveau because of its focus on the, the surface. And they said that it didn't produce spatial effects, it only produced surface effects. And what I thought I would do 
tonight is very briefly lay out some of the principles of an architecture designed with surfaces and talk a little bit about the spatial and tectonic implications of a surface generated architecture. Um, and if I could have the slides. So the secessionist uh, school, which <laughs> It, this is just to show you uh, an example of some of the rhythmic effects. Um, the, the old brick building uh, housed an exhibition that a painter named Fabian and Marcaccio and I did uh, this last spring called The Tingler, named after the famous Hollywood B film. And what I thought I would show you is a, a way that we tried to connect the vegetable or cabbage dome of the secession building with the gallery spaces. And so we took that dome as an originator and dragged it through the space and let it drift through the galleries. And it produced a, a smooth and continuous surface. Now, unlike some people, I'm not really interested in having an architecture that mimics computer software. And I think it's a mistake to understand the tectonics of these kinds of systems as monolithic, continuous, and singular. Instead, these surfaces are based on calculus, where the components of them, or the splines, are differentially defined, meaning that no two elements are exactly defined, but they're always defined in relation one to another. And, and I'll show you in some of the line drawings the kinds of effects that produces. Now, when you start to devolve those surfaces into their components, what you find is a rhythmic structure which is not based on spacing of similar elements, but which is based on intervals between elements where the elements themselves change their shape and size in a sequence. So that the rhythmic effects are effects both of non-standard components changing shape in a pattern, but also the intervals between those elements generating a pattern. So that the, the specific effects of, of surface-based architecture is that the components from which they are assembled generate rhythms and patterns both in their spacing and dimension and also in the shape and form of the elements themselves. So this is a, kind of a study model of this installation. You can see this kind of uh, tingler structure running through the building. And I just thought I would run, quickly run through the working drawings we did to construct it, where the elements themselves have animation and rhythm built into their pattern. So that it's not just that there's a singular continuous surface, but there's a rhythmic continuity between all of the components of the building. Uh, you may have to drop these manually. They're glass-mounted slides. Um, the, the second principle of these surface-based tools, the first being that they're based on the, the differential calculus, the, the second is that you can generate a generic system which is procedurally recalculated. Uh, if you could go to the, just drop one or two of the glass-mounted ones. So the, the, the calculation of these surfaces is procedural, meaning that you can build in information, you can calculate it once, and go back and change that information, and all of the components within the system are simultaneously recalculated. So you get, uh, for free, let's say, an organic holism. Now, it's not a holism based on reducibility to pure numbers, but it's a holism based on a simultaneous calculation of elements in a, in a sequence. So that a change in any component will automatically change all of the neighboring components. Okay, so if you can jump, say, three slides up. Okay, well, th that's a view from the, the structure back out of the dome and into the city. Okay, if I could get the next... Uh, Great. This is just to, to show you an image of the same kind of, of tectonic structure in the church project that Michael mentioned earlier, where none of these elements are the same, but all of the elements fall within a pattern that could be interpolated and extended. 
so that again, when you're in these spaces, your eye reads them in terms of a flow or a motion that can be extended beyond the elements. So it's not as if you look at the elements and reduce them to a standard or read their variation against a pure form, but you actually read them rhythmically rather than against uh, an origin point. And, and I think one of the third principles is that fractional numbers are equally valid to whole numbers, so that when you're working with a differential equation, numbers like three and seven and certain harmonic proportions get replaced with rhythmic proportions. And clearly that's something that appears in these beautiful images of Carl's. Okay, the, this is now a, a project for the Cincinnati Country Day School that I'm doing in collaboration with Michael McInturf and GBBN Architects. It uses a lot of the same principles as the church, but a more sophisticated repertoire of surface modulations. So it's similar to the church, it's a long span shed structure, and hanging from that structure are a whole series of small uh, building envelopes. And here you get a sense of the variation of those elements, so that in order to control view, to control natural light and to define interior space, the surfaces are, are staggered and offset and louvered in ways that they set up different kinds of directionality through the space. So that the space is basically permeable through the whole envelope, so it's almost like a free plan, but all of the elements are modulated by overlap and offsets between surfaces. So it's like a kind of gill system where space flows through and is modulated and filtered. These are just some, some details of those different kinds of effects where these spaces open and close based on your orientation to them. And finally, I'd like to show uh, a prototype for a house that I'm working on. When I say house, it's a prototype for thousands of houses, actually, where I'm trying to think through identity and variation questions in a way that could engage the, the contemporary market economy that architects are working in. Now, this generic logic where you can build in a set of parameters and then vary that procedurally by changing one element was the strategy for this. So instead of a modernist house where you build a minimal unit and add kits of parts to it or subtract elements from it, we came up with a system where you could have uh, 2,024 components of structure and panel and you could go from something, a single room trailer house to say a five bedroom villa without adding or subtracting any of the components. So the idea is that you systematize the relationships between elements and link them, and then you can vary these elements continuously and use exactly the same processes for fabrication and, and assembly. So these are some of the generative diagrams of different moments within these envelopes. I'll just run through. We came up with about 900 volumes, and again, there's no, uh, there's really no interrogation of domesticity or use in these yet. It's really a study for controlling construction systems and envelopes. And we then took these elements and started to divide them into groups of components. The first technique was to break each panel down, group them into eight bands, template those surfaces out in a planar way, and then cut them with a robotically controlled high-pressure water jet. And, oh, can you go back one? <laughs> okay, well, that, that steel element you saw then gets folded up and the surfaces are welded. Oh, I guess I lost it. To, to recover the original, vol or the total volume. The second technique was to mill panels out of blocks of, there it is, out of blocks of material and, and explode this, the panels into chips or double curved surfaces, but lay them down as a flat panel and skin them into a single landscape. You can see the single landscape on the bottom. Then we could mill out of a material all of the panels and reassemble each one of those panels from the landscape to achieve the, the surface. And I think we did about 10 or so of these 
you know, the largest ones being about a meter and a half long or so. So, and, and the issue for jumping the scale up is just increasing the size of the panels that are cut with the, the robotic mill. So then, most recently, we took six of these prototypes and started to develop them at a full architectural scale. Here, where you see the six volumes, we, we calculated shading devices, which would look at inflections in the surface and put shading elements only where south-facing exposures were. And you can see that the, the material is calculated on the form in a very organic way, the way, say, moss would grow on the north surfaces of a tree. The shading elements formed only on the southern exposed surfaces. elevations of those six prototypes. And again, each one of these has exactly the same number of elements with exactly the same adjacencies and neighboring elements. And finally, the working drawings that we developed where we templated out and exploded each one of those elements and described them independently. But again, you can see the, the kind of rhythmic pattern effects of the surfaces in the way that you get a, a repetition which is non-standard and, and not identically repeated, but in fact has a kind of rhythmic change in form and dimension. And that's it. Thanks. Lights on. Is that a no? I'd like to have the lights turned on to reduce the expectation that I can show anything any more spectacular than what you've heard. Thank you very much. You'll uh, forgive me if I don't try to compete with the work you've seen on the screen. I can't do it. Um, It almost as if the as if the presentations tonight were choreographed, as if uh, Carl shows the intellectual and philosophical ambitions for the work, and uh, Ben and Caroline show organizational principles and analytic techniques and new critical criteria to evaluate uh, the difference between the work and its historical evolution, and then Greg comes in and shows uh, tectonic and material. Uh, specifications of those prior uh, discussions, and then, and then I keep thinking, what am I supposed to do? You know, I'm supposed to <laughs> tell the story. <laughs> Why we do this? Uh, so I'll try to do that. Um, so I thought I'd tell a little bit of story before I do. Though I want to say two things. One, I want to thank uh, Michael for an incredibly gracious uh, introduction. I'm always interested in how. Host faced my problem of uh, the problem of credentials when one doesn't have any, but it was very interesting his effort, and I, I, <laughs> I appreciated it. Um, the other thing I'd like to say quickly is how important it is for you, especially students in the in the group, because they brought us here. Uh, recognize the power of forming a community, of going out of your way to form an artificial community of like-minded friends who have nothing in common and force yourselves to call yourselves a group and have meetings and get up each morning and email each other because what I thought was actually a profoundly moving and intelligent presentation comes out of that. The, none of these guys were that smart four years ago and their work wasn't that. <laughs> and uh, it's the truth and uh, their work wasn't that good four years ago and you know so, so what we actually did was got behind closed doors and uh, you know, talked to each other and complimented each other and, you know, it wasn't, you know, I don't know how to, it's a kind of sociology of a community and, and all of a sudden the work starts to become really incredibly interesting and then we kind of go out in public and, anyway, I recommend it to you. 
the downside, and of course, every morning I get up and I have these emails and, uh, you know, incredible arguments with every one of these guys and other people, Sanford, and even people that have nothing to do with what we do, but we love and we love the way they argue, so we make them join our group against their will, like Bob Somel, and, uh, <laughs> who's now humiliated. Um, so I get up, but the bad side is, of course, I, as a result of that, I understood every word that uh, Carl said. Um, <laughs> So there is, there is something, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, you could call that the downside or the upside. So the story, why we do this, the story. Um, the story goes something like this. I was uh, reading Mark Wigley's book, let's start, let's pick a story. Mark Wigley's book on white walls, uh, a brilliant book, and, and I thought, you know, he was analyzing the role of white in modern architecture. And, and uh, over the course of his arguments, I realized he did one thing. He took an architectural effect, he took something, the, a white wall, and essentially gave an account of it, a brilliant account of it in three, in three discourses. He explained it in terms of perception, not just white as an abstract comment, but he would go to shades of white. He explained it in terms of semiotics, associative meanings, and the capacity of uh, an effect to be explained by as a series of informations and codes. And he explained it in terms of Marxist economics, the kinds of uh, uh, social organizations and economics and exchange organizations that supported it. So health supported by a certain kind of uh, dissemination of information made possible by certain optics of color. And I thought this was actually astonishing. But what that meant was that an architectural effect in principle was an effect that could be devolved into other discourses, particularly master discourses, uh, psychology, Marxist economics, and science. And I started to wonder, does that mean that, is that true? Is our architectural effect simply a composite effect of other effects? Or was there such a thing as an irreducible quality to an architectural effect so that one could speak of a discourse of architectural effects? And uh, were there techniques for producing such architectural effects? Was there such a thing as an architectural knowledge, which was a knowledge about how to produce these effects and why to produce these effects? That is kind of an argument I started to think about. And as I started to research this, I thought I'd, what I would do is, first of all, suspend my investigation of architecture for a moment and start looking at other disciplines, music, acting, painting, you know, whatever. Um, uh, fashion photography, fashion, to see was there such a thing as a musical effect? In other words, is a musical effect, a kind of scientific effect of perception that could be um, devolved into Marxist economics? And, and in the end, the, the answer led me to some of the arguments that I think might be pertinent to the discussion tonight. And I won't belabor this, but I mean, because what I was in search of is, is there such a thing as architectural knowledge? And is, is architectural knowledge a form of composite form of other forms of knowledge? Now, to make a long story short, as I began this investigation, I started to realize that uh, one had to forget the idea of justification of process. In other words, we're, we're used to doing a project and explaining how we did it, and as if how we did it gave an account of why it does what it does. It would be a little bit like a musician explaining to you why he played a chord or why he sang a certain thing or, or use a certain lick to produce an effect. And, and it's really completely uninteresting. I mean, if the, if the work doesn't produce an effect, who cares why you did it? You know, so can you imagine, I don't know, Trenton Reznor comes out, plays a song, you don't get it, and then he explains it to you. <laughs> and, then, and then you start, oh, I, I, I got it. You know? <laughs> so uh, anyway, I began to discover some things like the, the peculiarities of techniques, for example, drummers that, ha that essentially teach other, each other new drumming rhythms uh, on the basis of teaching other, each other new dances, not new counting, not, you know, it's not reducing it to mathematics or not giving it in a mathematical language, but giving it in a, you know, using this, a language of technique. I can teach you to make this new drumming effect if you'll listen to the following thing. Dance like a rabbit does this, or something like that. And then actors that great, give great acting performances, like um, Anthony Hopkins uh, in Silence of the Lambs, in order to create a sense of menacing, studying a cat. Because he, you know, so while he's trying to play, while you see a serial killer on screen, he's playing a cat. <laughs> 
He's not saying, how do I act like a serial killer? He's saying, how do I act like a cat, hoping that when you see him acting like a cat, you'll see a serial killer. So, you know, for example, he doesn't blink his eyes because he notices cats don't blink his eyes. And he works out a deal with Jodie Foster that she blinks her eyes extra. So in that scene in the prison where she's talking to him, he never blinks his eyes, and she's blinking extra, and he looks extra menacing. So, so these are incredible acting effects that have nothing to do with some universal form of knowledge, either mathematics or Marxism or semiotics, that, that are specific to the material practices of, um, to the material practices of an organized form of social or cultural practice. And I began to get increasingly confident that architecture had such things, that architecture would produce architectural effects, and that architecture could, produce, could develop research and technique and knowledge, but that it would not necessarily take the form of sounding like or looking like scientific research or scientific knowledge or even semiotic research or sci semiotic knowledge. It wouldn't even have to make sense. It would just have to be produce additional architectural effects and communicate as knowledge among architects. So in a certain sense, I, I began to argue about the it, two things. One is the material specificity of knowledge. So in a certain sense, I disagree with uh, Carl about the universal Turing machine. I do not believe that there will ever be, that there's such a thing as knowledge that can be abstracted from its material practices. And therefore, I offer the idea that instead of thinking about architectural knowledge, we talk about architectural expertise, and that we undertake a process of architectural research to produce architectural effects and increase architectural expertise. Uh, and I think actually they're already doing it. So I'm, like I said, I'm just telling the story about what you saw. I, I'm not arguing about that. Um, and it basically had to do with something like this. I mean, all, calc all computers, and they use a lot of computers, in order to do a computation, have to abstract essential information from an enormous sea of information. So in order, in order to do one of the formal uh, um, manipulations that they do, the computer has to do a limited number of computations which it believes to be have abstracted the essential properties of the enormous number of calculations that the material logic it would, would itself do. And what the architect does through his own expertise and knowledge is to go back and restore the effects of those missing calculations to those computations. So I believe that it's true that everything is a calculation. It's just not true that a computer, that there will be ever, there's ever an adequate abstraction of a calculation into a computation. Hence, there is such a thing as architectural art expertise. It's materially specific. It's transmitted as knowledge, but not as abstract knowledge. So one last thing to say, and that is, why would we do this? And I'll tell you one quick story, and then I'll be through. I, I got interested in, because now we have this model. I have a model of knowledge and expertise that's practice and materially specific. An actor is, has acting knowledge that's specific to the craft and techniques of acting. Same thing for all the other forms. But at the same time, we also know that knowledge moves from one discipline to another discipline. You know, so then, then you have this other problem, because that seems to imply a notion of communication, abstraction, semiotics, all the dematerialized, deterritorialized de ideas of abstract knowledge that underlied the philosophy of, um, of research and knowledge before this. Hence, I, I needed to find some way of thinking about how knowledge moved from discipline to discipline. And in the end, the answer to that will be through something called the diagram. I won't discuss that now. But it does, it is able to move, but, what, but when it goes to the new discipline, it doesn't go in any form as a representation. So by the time he's acting like a cat, he's no longer representing a cat, he's acting. It's no longer acting, good acting or bad acting because how well or poorly he represents the cat, it's good acting because it produces an acting effect. But the diagram of the cat has migrated from the behavior of a cat to a performance of an actor. And I thought I'd tell you one more story and then we'd have a discussion. Um, you know, Leibniz, I, I, I'm also incredibly fond of monads. You know, like I said, I understand all that stuff. And uh, in 1597, the, the microscope started to um, become very popular. It was invented in the, in the 1580s. By 1597, pretty much everybody that could afford one that, and could read and was reasonably well educated owned a microscope. Uh, and between 1597 and 1650 to 1660, the microscope prolifer proliferated over. It was like the cell phone, the cell phone of its times. So everybody had microscopes. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really irritating, too, because you'd go to a restaurant and people would pull out their microscope. 
so, uh, and what's interesting at the time is mathematics during that period of time between the end of the 16th century and the middle of the 17th century was concerned with very large structures, infinite structures, infinite series, etc. And uh, if you read the monadology and you read, um, so, so 50 years, the microscope starts to disseminate. Um, mathematics is interested in a certain domain, that the domain of the infinite or very large ma um, numbers in mathematics. By about the middle of the 16th century, I'm sorry, the middle of the 17th century, um, it starts to change. And micro mathematics starts to develop a discourse of minute structures, infinite infinitesimals and small um, the, the behavior of small things. So, it, and then, and of course, as you know, by by the middle, by the end of that century, Leibniz and uh, Newton have developed the theories of the calculus, and they are debating about the theories of the calculus. But what the, essentially the calculus is is the first great mathematics of infinitesimally small um, elements in relationship to one another. And at the same time, Leibniz is writing in his notebook, as he's describing the monadology, he says, there is a world, and in the world there's a pond, but if we take one drop of water out of the pond and look in it, we find a world again. And he, so he's describing the monad, and it's clearly a description in which at that point is representing his experiences with the microscope. But the other hand, so that's a representational moment, but the sublimation, the movement of the diagram is the affect. In other words, his seeing that, his feeling that, his sensing that moves not as representing knowledge. He's not going to do mathematics to represent the microscopic moment. What he's going to do is become interested in the, the affect, the sensation, the feelings of thinking about a problem that has migrated from the microscope into mathematics. So in a certain sense, what I believe is the calculus is a diagrammatic sublimation of the affect of the microscope into the material practices of mathematics. And in that model, I began to realize that all knowledge moves around and produces new knowledge by migrating not as representation, but as a diagram that sublimates into each material form and expertise. And that that gives purpose to our madness. So, thank you. Wow, well, I, uh, I, I won't even pretend to follow uh, uh, such, a, such an incredible performance uh, as, as the previous uh, four. Um, our idea for, uh, for having a panel discussion was to have, of course, a panel and, and then to have a discussion. Um, uh, I have, a, uh, I have a, a kind of a roaming microphone here, and, and I think what we would like to do uh, is to see if there are general kind of questions that the panelists may have to ask among themselves. Uh, uh, but beyond that, I, would, I have a few questions I would be interested to ask. And I think, uh, I suspect, and in fact, I hope my class, actually, uh, in particular, uh, has, has some questions that they would like to ask. I think these were really four amazing uh, performances. Uh, and um, I would like to ask if the panelists have I mean, Statements talk, beyond. So they, th yeah, that's really right. Sick of each other. They'll do emails tomorrow morning. So <laughs> you just ask us. Though. We should open it up. Yeah. They're, they're simply. Oh. Now they're big questions. You have a question, Michael. I have a, fancy, I have a very fancy microphone here, and I, I, I really, <laughs> I really, really want to use it. It's like Jeff's. Uh, <laughs> we're not even at a restaurant yet. Um, Path is blocked. Well, since no one is going to ask a question, um, maybe uh, no. Seriously, uh, we we really should. Uh, yeah. Okay. Bo, I I I, no, no, I suspect I'll, I can't. I'll speak loudly. I'll re I'll repeat it because we'll want to uh, record this for posterity's sake. 
it's how you handle the diagram. I mean, if you are not uh, the one who can f uh, visualize or conceptualize the diagram, then then you cannot put it into an organizational principle. So so if we use a diagram, and maybe uh, in that sense, I think we we all work with diagrams and maybe give all a different answer, maybe. But but we believe that the diagram is 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 not a linguistic construction. It's not referring to any kind of reductionist uh, uh, attitude. Uh, it's not. Um, yeah, it's, pro it's a proliferating apparatus to work with, uh, to get rid of other classical uh, interpretations of there where, uh, let's say, language might cheer or, or uh, turn maybe an, 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 an principle into an, an organization that is actually uh, coming from a typological organization. The diagram, uh, diagram is there to be, to, to be conceptualized. Yeah. Right. There's a, I mean, I would also just say that the types of diagrams that architects are using have implicit in them certain kinds of, of affects. And I, I think that the question about evolution and, and motion and movement when you're using calculus-based tools like most architects have on their desktops these days, implicit in those is a certain kind of uh, motion. I mean, in the sense that calculus is, you know, often called the motion pictures of mathematics, that there's a rhythm and sequence of elements that automatically affects the way you think about the tool. And again, this procedural aspect where you can start to rerun these things and get different results by changing different factors within them also gives you a different notion of time and, and evolution. So, I mean, it, it was in uh, an exhibition in Oslo where I'd done this kind of, you know, what I thought was a dumb kind of dome, but a dome that was generated with animation. And at the opening, all these people were walking around in loops and saying, where should we stand? Where should we stand? And I kept saying, well, it's generated with animation and calculus. You're really supposed to walk around. There's really no point where you stand and get it. And I realized that implicit in these diagrams, even this thing, which was just turned from a diagram into a structure immediately, there's a different kind of perceptual model and a different kind of motion model that now, you know, most of the architects we're familiar with are starting to experiment with. Should, uh, more, you want more talk on that? Sure. More talk on that, sure, of course. Uh, the, the question is, is the kind of, uh, is the kind of question I think we should be keenly, we should tune our ears to clean, keenly because basically the, the principle of the question, Bo, I guess is your name, and I don't mean to attack you. Are you if you're a student, though, I do mean it. But um, He's also in my class, Jeff. <laughs> the, quest, the question is basically has the following structure. There is information in the diagram. The, in, the purpose of the diagram is to transmit that information transparently. If, you, if the diagram is a mobile diagram and you stop it and pick a piece of it or use it in some other way, you're destituting the information. So it's, a, it's based on the notion of, a, uh, of the possibility of an abstract dematerialized knowledge which can be transmitted semiotically by, the, by this uh, innocent vector. Well, our argument is it's something quite different, is that the diagram itself is, is not that. It enters into architecture as a sublimation of knowledge, but we use it because of our architectural intuition to produce the affects in organizations that we know. So a good example, I, I think maybe the greatest building I've decided for, right this second for me in history is, uh, is the Guggenheim Museum um, by Frank Lloyd Wright. And I love that building because uh, <laughs> you have to really be careful. Uh, <laughs> I love that building because um, not only does it uh, end the typology of the temple, as, I mean, art, the, an art museum is a temple, but it also is the first major work of urban infrastructures architecture. So you, the great ambition of 20th century art was that it would be part of life um, and not appreciated in passing, but be part of life en passant. <laughs> 
that one would walk by art, have art as part of their infrastructural life, part of the flow of the, the everyday rhythm of life, that art would become quotidian, gets realized in this building as an architectural problem, I mean, as an architectural effect. So, and it, so this a diagram, in fact, the diagram of the parking lot enters into the, to Frank Lloyd's right thinking, and as a result, he produces a building in fact, one of the very few buildings I know of where program is essential to the architecture, where the thing actually produces its architectural effects with people in it doing what it's supposed to do, as opposed to quality of space or quality of light or beauty of form. And, and it's only because an intuition about the architectural possibilities of a diagram, the ramp and the parking, are read against the possibilities of knowledge and in terms of the architectural uh, uh, expertise of the architect. So, I mean, it's really important that we pay attention to where one hopes that an abstract notion of knowledge, which is always, it's actually tr not true that it's abstract, but it's the pseudo-scientific model of, of knowledge and research, uh, is going to guide our abilities to be better architects. That's not true. In fact, none of the diagrams that we saw are in, in any sense interesting as science. Uh, but, they, but they carry great knowledge architecturally. Does this answer your question? Any other questions? Yeah, there's a, actually, uh, <laughs> Neil has a question. Um, I get to use my... Jeff. I want to probe Jeff's uh, either real or feigned sort of discomfort uh, on the panel. He's both quite comfortable, but, but on the other hand, uh, a bit nervous about a lack of credentials. But. Uh, I want to bring up a couple of quotes which, in a way, there's a certain polarity which on the one hand, in terms of the identity of the group, needs to be brought out a little bit more. It's a, it's a sort of basic one. And, and that's probably between the idea of diagram, which itself might be a, an illustration for um, pseudo or real processes which uh, obviously use um, classical uh, physics, classical mathematics, or 20th century developments in, in the computing system. One is by uh, Robert Ryman, a painter who I don't know if Mark Wigley discussed in, in the book on white, probably did, but his famous quote was, for me the question is not what to paint or why to paint, but only how to paint. Uh, revealing the, the total content of the project in potentially the idea of technique. Um, the second is by Co-op Himmelblau who said, the more we love to design, the more we believe people will love to be in our buildings. Now one on the one hand talks about affect, the Himmelblau position talks about affect, which is take whatever route necessary to deliver the love, so to speak. And uh, the first one is about placing everything in terms of value at the level of the how. And Jeff, you talked about actually dealing with the why. Are you struggling with the why and dealing with having to answer the why? Because you're the one who, who, who will do that and the rest of the panel have already sort of buried completely the why and they're only obsessed with the how. Um. It's awful to hear them say why. That's one thing. Um, when they say why, I, I get that. The, uh, I'm going to actually want to turn this question over quickly to, to Ben because I think Ben has some thoughts on technique and Carolyn has some thoughts on technique that are really pertinent to the question. But there's a whole history of quotes like you're talking about, like Picasso saying, I don't know anything about beauty, but I, all I know about the problems of painting. You know, or John Lennon saying, uh, when asked what music does he like to listen to, he says, I don't like to listen to music anymore, I just like to write it. You know, so there's a whole history of these things. I think in a certain sense, the problem of technique for the architect is the only problem. I think at a certain point in your architectural development, you, you use the problem of why to guide you to certain questions of technique. But in the end, technique carries with it already in its fully saturated and sublimated form all that problem. And, and, and I don't think actually that they should even be burdening themselves with the problem of why in a certain sense. I mean, look what's happened to Carl. I mean, that's all he thinks about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think maybe Carl should speak a little bit about why and Ben and Carolyn should speak about technique because they have sort of theorized it so much. Yeah, I, but I, I think you, yeah, as architects, you would also be in danger of, of becoming very boring if you were not uh, asking uh, the why question too, you might be um, you might be more wrong. Uh, 
than if you were only talking about the how, so you're more at risk. But um, you, you, yeah, you, I think you need to, to find uh, a drive and, um, and uh, a need to do things more from the why. You will find, you're more likely to find that in questions of why than of just how. But Carolyn, let me ask you something because uh, you know, I often go, like, if you go to a jazz concert, you know, and you, like I'll go to a jazz concert, and many of you will go to rock concerts or whatever, and you'll, you'll watch the musicians, and the entire audience will be completely absorbed. You know, their, their bodies will be, be, they'll be hypnotized in a certain sense, mm -hmm. and you'll think, and they'll be playing, and you think, surely, in order to play like that, they too have to be hypnotized. But if you watch carefully, they're doing something like looking at the sound engineer and saying a little more balance, or, you know, they're doing everything, they're just technically watching their production in order to make sure that others mm -hmm. have the effect, the affect. They're not really letting them, they get lost in a certain sense, but they have to be constantly conscious and outside of that in order to be in control of their technique. And I think in the end, it's a mistake to confuse the production and the consumption. I mean, a discussion of consumption for me is really important, but the tech, in order to, to be a great musician, you actually can't listen to the music. And in order to be a great actor, I think you can't get caught up in what the story is being told. And the same thing is with an architect. You have to focus on the, on the, on the mastery of your technique and your apparatus whether that's construction of materials and structure or light or organizational things. Yeah, I, I, I agree, you do, that, but that as well. I think you also have to have your, your own program. You have to, to, um, to know what you want mm -hmm. as well, in which is some, something that is uh, not purely uh, coming from the techniques. Of course you are um, trying to, you, I think, for instance, it's important for architects to try to invent things, which is maybe um, a very futile uh, wish. So we can only invent maybe small things, small techniques. But they then do the wish to invent something is that which uh, allows you to to make this new technique and develop it. Well, it's funny though that whenever I've been teaching in Europe. The students will always come to class and I'll talk about how we'll be using digital technology and they'll always start telling me what they want the computers to do. Before they've even turned it on, they'll say, well, what I would like to do is, you know, blow this form around with a force and capture it in the following ways. Whereas in the States, there's a big difference where everyone always wants to learn what the computers want to do to them rather than tell the computers what they want them to do. And I think that, in fact, Neil's question is very on target in a certain way, that instead of proceeding from a critical position, you let go of a certain kind of critical position and accept that some form of culture and media and technique is going to take over architecture in some way. I mean, I think that's why the other Guggenheim is probably so successful, is that it's like it's one of the first special effects in recent architectural history. I mean, it's the equivalent of a Godzilla special effect, and everyone understands that. I mean, when you talk to non-architects, immediately they say, this is a Hollywood film, and this is a film like Godzilla. It's a monster in the city, and why is it that architects aren't engaging this kind of cultural milieu? You know, which a lot of other disciplines like graphic design and industrial design have already done, and they do it primarily through technique. I'm, I'm curious. I Hello. Uh, yeah. Um, hmm. um, th there's a there's a question that seems to me should be asked of everybody, uh, and, and that is there's been a lot of discussion about uh, uh, the shift away from representation, um, and there are lots of issues at stake in that. Um, I know a lot of the tech. I mean, and we're talking about techniques, but many of the techniques that have been described, even Jeff's notion of sensibility, is one that in some ways tries to relax, if not to get rid of altogether representation. And I wonder if you might all say something about uh, what's wrong with representation, sort of as a, as a kind of a recent historical problem, because it's, a, it's an intellectual as well as a, a design problem, and how it is that the techniques 
that you employ, either animation, sensibility, branching systems, or um, even the manimal, uh, and the way the manimal functions in your practice, how, how is it that these escape the problems of representation as you see them? I hope this microphone is working. I, did, mm, I, I think we have seen already enough uh, representations in architectural uh, history. I mean, if it, it, yeah, I, maybe I would like to also combine the answer to the two questions uh, from one and uh, new, in the sense that, that um, if you use the techniques you work with well, then, then you could maybe avoid representational techniques uh, by uh, using maybe instrumental methods instead of uh, representational methods. The instrumental is far more interesting because it, void, it voids any kind of uh, signification, uh, it delays any uh, meaning given to, to what's the, the way what, what you produce for a building. I mean, you're right that maybe on the one hand we should not think about uh, the way how the project is consumed and be seen, and 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 for that reason, maybe referring back to also some something that Jeff said, it is for that reason coming back to the minimal. It, it is interesting to um, to have uh, interpretation of your projects who are multi uh, multi dimensional in the sense that that for instance or like. Uh, electricity station, what we designed uh, a few years ago, five years ago, uh, uh, people were saying that it was a temple, or it was a kind of theater, or it was an yeah, it was a more to, a building related to a cemetery, um, and and I think that that this kind of double reading, this instrumental reading, is is actually uh, an, an quality we have learned in other disciplines. I mean, like in art, uh, Andy Warhol was the best one who used. Uh, experimental, instrumental techniques to avoid representational interpretations. And I think, um, yeah, we are looking for these techniques um, to, yeah, to, to look at other meanings for that what we produce ourselves. Uh, think of of it as being why why would we say it was wrong or not wrong it would that would depend on the context that we were asking this question in i i i think don't think uh, it would occur to me to to um, to think in such an abstract uh, on such an abstract level um, about representation or you know um, maybe any other notion in architecture. So I agree very much with Jeff that um, that these um, these quest, such questions are actually quite specific in architecture, and I, I it's not an, a vac sort of philosophy in a vacuum. So they would be representational. Um, a representational approach would only be wrong if, if it was not appropriate, for instance, because you are um, you have you work in a, in a different condition and and with different programs. Farshid Musavi said about the Yokohama Port Terminal that she and Alejandra were interested in strategies of building in representation, you know, rather than adding it on or beginning with it that certain kinds of effects would get built into the project in an incremental way. And it, that hit me in a way that it, it, there was a real resonance. And I realized that with the Korean church, Mike and Doug and I had no idea of what a precedent for a Korean church would be at that scale. We didn't know. And our only recourse was to start with basically what was a kind of featureless space and add traits like light from behind, like surfaces oriented to the altar, various kinds of traits that we would just add in, which were purely representational traits. So in the end, there was a desire to make a thing which looked and felt like a church, but we didn't start with some catalog of, of techniques. We actually tried to build them in. So, and I think that's probably another thing that would, you know, work through, you know, contemporary design in an interesting way as a shift from typologies to the orchestration of traits or effects. <laughs>
you know, so representation isn't a kind of master discourse, it's just a, a kind of set of, of operations that get, it ad, get added into architecture. Well, um, there are a number of things. You know, the question of representation has, you know, uh, on many levels. Uh, I think the most trivial one is the one that, um, that, you know, we're talking about at the level of iconic representations. But at the deeper level, I think it's a deeply philosophical and problematic issue. And I, for one, don't know what representation is about anymore. Um, meaning that, um, you know, if you think in terms of uh, the, you know, reality as a form of creative evolution, and that why does things come out the way they do, and that uh, on this planet there are only but I mean there's something like 1.4 million species, but that do not necessarily exhaust the possible all possible species that can uh, you know come into being. So what creates these conditions? What you know give life? Uh, what are the conditions or the the underlying sort of cosmological infrastructure that gave rise to you know self organizations? And what are the forces? What are the reasons? Or is there any kind of underlying principles? I mean, those are the issues that I'm interested in. And uh, it's a deeply problematic question. Um, and I think architecture is implicated in those set of questions. Uh, and for me, the diagrammatic sort of representation, diagrammatic relationships into the migration of diagrams are transversal sort of set of relationships. But they don't necessarily uh, address issues of genetic sort of uh, evolutionary systems, that things evolve over time and there are emergent phenomena and that uh, they, they seem to or have their own sort of autonomous independence or logic uh, to it. And that's very difficult to uh, discern what they are. I mean, even though we, in this century we have uh, come to terms with the fact that you know, there's a DNA, you know, we have cracked the DNA code and so forth, but still, I mean, that points to a condition that is, uh, that, uh, that, you know, that there is a condition of uh, reason, so to speak, but not the kind of reason that you and I speak, but uh, what uh, Heraclitus, uh, the pre-Socratic philosopher, called logos. And I, for one, uh, for quite some time, was quite critical of uh, logos or logocentric thinking, you know, derived from, uh, you know, sort of deconstructive sort of a, uh, uh, discourse. But the more I think deeply, I realize that logos itself intrinsically, it's uh, has it's sort of a very deep sort of a, you know uh, sort of reservoir what uh, in 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 the Greek notion about my, mimesis. So I think is uh, the problem of rep representation is really uh, you know from uh, uh, is a problem of mimesis that what are the underlying principles that gave rise to everything that self organized and evolved over time, and so you know. In fact, uh, Jeff and I uh, were reading uh, a book uh, recently, uh, a, a discussion between a neurobiologist neurobiolo and a mathematician. And according to this mathematician, it's Alan Cohn, who's a French mathematician, he says that the physical universe is a representation of a, uh, rather is a representation of the universe of mathematics, and that it is a subset. Whereas, of course, the neurobiologist says that it is not. You know, uh, nobody can sort of give you a factual proof. But one thing is certain that you know the universe that we exist, uh, that we inhabit, are based on a set of uh, initial conditions, and that these initial set of conditions do determine the type of physical universe within which we inhabit. And there's a whole universe of possible initial conditions. So uh, from a theoretical disembodied obstruction, you know, Jack would say that uh, the universe of you know, possible worlds, you know, or rather the set of the universe of possible was much larger than the specific set of universe within which we inhabit and all the uh, you know, self-organizing implications and evolutionary structures and the, you know, and plus you and I. So I think the larger question for architecture is that uh, we are implicated in the, uh, the evolution of the, lo of, of, of the logos and my Mises has to be addressed in those terms. Oh, please do, yes. To speak in favor of representation for two seconds. Uh, but you have to just, you just well, I know, but now that you know, speak of representation. One of the great powers of matter that, could, that is so is such a great power that we'd be a fool to uh, to make it unavailable to ourselves is for matter to look like other matter. I mean, you know, to paint an apple is pretty amazing. You make paint look like the apple, or you. Uh, make a drum sound like a heartbeat, or you make drive it look like stucco. I mean, this is a fantastic power. Or you make a billboard look like an arch. I mean, th this is a power of matter to imitate other matters. Uh, 
uh, and it's, it's an opportunity that we would never, we shouldn't just squander. The problem is that every time you do that, you take whatever material organization you're working in and you have to reduce its properties. In order to paint an apple more and more and more accurately like an apple, to turn it into a dematerialized, deterritorialized sign, I have to eliminate all the information and all the knowledge and all the calculations that are capable to come from paint. So I much prefer a bacon representation of a face because it's no longer, I'm no longer interested in the, the capacity of the painting to make, to remind me of the subject matter, but, but the capacity of the painter to use a, a nuance of reminding me to, to, to produce an entirely new affect through the abilities of thinking through painting. So I'm not against representation, only to the, except to the extent to which it reduces the power and calculation of, pa of matter to produce other effects. It's, it's, it's inadequate to the, to well, a I mean, kind of an accounting of the initial conditions. Semiotics thrives on the, the notion of dematerialized, deterritorialized abstraction. It is the last gasp of a, of a notion of knowledge independent of its material relations, I mean material practices. And yet none of our lives are lived that way. Not one instant in any of our lives are actually lived out in the effective realization of this dream of dematerialized abstraction. So, you know, uh, uh, representation is great. It's just, tr it's just trivial if you devote your technique to mastering it. You know, I, it's like, you know Caroline is saying the same thing. You, like, you, if you're asked to do something with an arch, you, you know, fine. <laughs> if you make whatever you're working with look like an arch for the point of making someone see an arch and say, that's an arch, that's just, it, that's just stupid. You know, it's not, it's not a philosophical problem, it's just a problem in triviality. So I don't think anybody in here is positioned in a certain sense um, against representation since, since it's a power, because it's a power of matter. What we're interested in is what matter you know, what matter, what else matter can do. Uh, I'm, I would, um, I'm interested, for example, I don't think a cat has a bad version of a human representation of the world. I think it has an expert version of a cat's representation of the world. And I believe that that actually moves back and forth between me and my cat, you know. <laughs> uh, I, do we have a, a question? In, oh. Maybe, uh, well, we have a question from Abby, and then I think Tarek has you a You know, everyone question. by name. That's really impressive. I mean, one thing that I think is important is that the, the architecture isn't supposed to illustrate a text or a concept, and that going back and forth, I mean, doing, doing research and experimentation in design techniques and theorizing those design techniques within a, a, an intellectual history is always, it means I'm always going back and forth, and most of the time, actually, the writing is, is tracking the design experimentation. So in a certain way, I, I think it's more important to me to, to have the buildings understood through the theory, because the theory is actually what's tracking certain kinds of experiments. 
Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, one thing that's important is, you know, when I was a graduate student 10 years ago, there was a move to try to illustrate philosophy or to try to illustrate biology. And that's something I'm actually not interested in. I am interested in the, the historical precedence and the evolution of certain kinds of, of techniques, you know, primarily geometric into architecture. But usually that means that there's an experimentation in design and then that gets grounded in some other kind of development in order to find out what the next thing is to do. Right, but it's, it's really, it's a chicken or egg problem rather than trying to represent philosophy in architecture. Yeah, um, I think um, if you were to live in Amersfoort, you would know our work the other way around. You would know the buildings and not the writings. And I think if it's right, then far more people know architecture through their daily uh, life and their daily experience than through um, reading, which, you know, sometimes we think it's uh, by, uh, by ourselves, for ourselves kind of uh, writing. But on the other hand, I think um, writing for us is important because it's, uh, it consists of an articulation of our ideas and uh, a definition of our position maybe in the same way that, that a, a big uh, computer firm writes a mission statement, we see our writing uh, as a kind of mission statement. Did, can, 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 Carolyn, does that mean that you, uh, you think we shouldn't all go out and buy your book? <laughs> no, of course not. <laughs> yeah, uh, it seems like at, at the center of this argument there is a comment that uh, Carl mentioned in the beginning of his uh, presentation that referred to the uh, esoterics and the metaphysics of this whole phenomenon. And I think uh, what Carl brought into this discussion saying it's really about the metaphysics in architecture versus the physics which has been the central argument of architecture throughout centuries. Now we're dealing with it on a metaphysical level which is absolutely fundamental to, he, he came to it from a scientific computational angle, but ultimately is attempting to make architecture a metaphysical phenomenon and actually keeps it that way. And what uh, Jeff is saying is that abstract or metaphysical process that the architect is involved in during that process only stops at the point when we actually materialize architecture into reality. But what Carl is advancing is it's not true. We're collapsing the process of metaphysics and extending it into the act of materialization and it becomes actually collapsing what Neil was saying, the why and how. The why and how is no longer, are no longer separate because it's really operating within that notion of metaphysics that Carl is, uh, is advancing. And I think that is at the center of this argument. And if we ignore that aspect, the model that Jeff is advancing is true, but if you actually introduce that notion that Carl is talking about, I think, uh, and, and again, it refers to maybe what uh, uh, Bacon's uh, paintings or, uh, or uh, Marcel Duchamp's were attempting to do in art, but that's precisely what Carl and uh, Greg Lynn to some extent also is advancing here. And as the model of that is not the, cell, the atom of physics, but possibly is the cell of, uh, of biology, which completely puts it in a whole different realm. And if, uh, if the panel would like to take that point. Um, my thoughts exactly. Um, <laughs> there is a acrimonious dispute between Carl and me about the, the, prob the problem of universal knowledge versus materially specific knowledge. There is, however, something which I think is important to reaffirm, and I think you've mentioned, and that is, and it's a little embarrassing, one doesn't talk about their most intimate, uh, in their most intimate sense of their project in public. We do it in private. But there is a shared discussion between Carl and me and perhaps among the others on this table that the really the larger project that's, that's spectacular to reflect on is matters organizing itself so that consciousness emerges. So if you remember in his, in his statements, in his 20 statements, he talked about the emergence of consciousness. 
And what, you know, it's pretty, you may not think much of progress. Many of you may not believe the, in a notion like progress, but you can't imagine a time, let's say, if you be believe in the Big Bang, when there was no life and then there was life. I call that progress, so there was some progress. And then, then there's kind of life and then life that talks about itself. Now, I call that progress. You know, so, so there's certain big moments of progress, maybe not little moments of progress. And, and what that is is an emergence of consciousness. Now, whether if that emergence of, whether that consciousness is materially specific or is a spiritual uh, issue no longer connected to material practices is, is a worthy argument. It is, however, I think a shared ar argument that we have that in a certain small way, architecture participates in the evolution of consciousness. And, you know, if you're interested in this problem, Hegel made a certain argument about the historical state of consciousness, which was true. He believed that self-consciousness was the end of the evolution of consciousness. He believed that self-consciousness was a point in the history of consciousness. The issue now is, is was that the last point? And the, the answer is no. We, consciousness is evolving. For example, we now know that you know, when, when we look at stars, there are stars looking at themselves. So self-consciousness is no longer a property of us thinking about ourselves, but some of us reflect on the cosmos as thinking on itself through us. And architecture, writing, painting, science, all the material practices participate in the evolution and emergences of, of, new of new feelings and new affects and new consciousness by sublimating and transmitting these diagrams of knowledge. So it is a metaphysical problem, but it's not a metaphysical problem in the old sense that we need faith in something to believe in. It's actually a problem that I think that shows up in Carl's and mine and everyone else's argument as a sort of specific model of what matter does and what architecture as a material practice can do in that regard. Is that right, Carl? <laughs> Wasn't that number 19 on the, you know? <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> pretty close. <laughs> yeah. I got to go to the airport soon, yeah. so. <laughs> Come on, you uh, Maybe, uh, yes. Uh, well, did, did, did you want to answer that, Carl? Uh, no, I don't think I, uh, because it's, you know, even before Hegel, I mean, uh, uh, the reason I'm sort of hesitating is because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the same old problem that is emerging over and over again, and it's not just specific or unique to Western civilization. Uh, you know, when Parmenides, the pre-Socratic -Soc pre philosopher, when he says that being and thing thinking are one and the same reality, so essentially he has acquired, he's probably one of the first thinkers, in fact, it may be the first thinker who acquired self-consciousness. Uh, within uh, the history of uh, philosophy. So, uh, and I think but architects uh, has not quite uh, self-consciousness yet. I mean, I mean, I don't mean that, but what I'm proposing is that a new kind of architecture needs to take place and that that architecture may ultimately acquire another uh, sort of independent autonomous self-consciousness that is apart from human self-consciousness. And so far, we've been sort of too anthropocentric to some degree. And if we look at it from the perspective of a sort of a process cosmology, then you know the presence of self-consciousness is not just unique to human beings, but in fact, as Jeff pointed out, that it is consciousness of the universe thinking itself through itself. And so, if architecture, to, uh, if architecture is to be implicated with that kind of evolutionary structure, we would, we would have to come to terms with other type of emergent effects that have relative degrees of artificial life and artificial intelligence and that they have acquired autonomy of existence and maybe perhaps an artificial autonomy of existence that, that, uh, that may have a different kind of architecture uh, to look for. So I feel that uh, much of the, uh, I mean, the underlying logic of architecture that we have is still um, is not evolutionary approach, uh, but if we take into evolutionary considerations, I think we have to think seriously in terms of architecture becoming alive. Maybe we can take a, a couple, a couple more. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad I waited on this question because it kind of narrowed it down. Um, I was trying to do it. Question, but can we actually just say that we can forget about uh, 
I mean, this has to do with the uh, artistic problem of uh, creativity, uh, creativity as an art, uh, as, as, as this artistic uh, production, uh, uh, this whole issue of transcendence and, and inspiration. Can we, can we just, then just, just say that we can forget about, uh, as architects, artists, just forget about uh, this inspiration, uh, this thing that always transcends us, as uh, Carl perhaps is kind of a, uh, alluding to when he talks about metaphysics, uh, and we should just concentrate on some technique. I mean. No, no, I, I think, see, the funny thing about that is I think they're indissociable. In, in, your argument is, should we set aside the model of creativity and focus on the model of technique? My investigation on creative, the history of creativity in various disciplines has, try, has basically argued that creative people are creative by perfecting their technique, not by setting out to be creative. And then the other thing is, uh, I mean, because I know a lot of people, for example, that have tremendously great ambitions and if they could do in architecture what they say they want to do in architecture we would have an incredible world but they just don't have the technique so the creativity is not the problem the other problem is a model that you think of creativity as, as an individual enterprise and in fact I don't think so I think we're all part of an ecology of consciousness just like in your you know you would like to say your creativity is in your brain the fact of the matter is you might, it might be 50 cells in your brain, and are, do you just give it creativity? Do you give it the credit? Like if you get money for, do you give those 50 cells the, the credit? No, you, the ecology of your entire body, you understand, is part of it. And at the same time, you're part of a social ecology, not an economy, you're part of a social and material ecology. And that's why it's not surprising when a, a new thought that's creative arises, it arises spontaneously in a community. Einstein's publication of Equal MC Square, which is so famous, was published 20 times, 20 times before he finally realized that it was not a mathematical artifact, but actually physics. So he could not have had the thought unless a community of creative minds, essentially working in parallel processing, made that thought possible. So this model that we think of Einstein as a sole genius with great creativity is in error. But is there creativity? Yes, creativity is the emergence of creative consciousness in a community of minds. So, I mean, I, I think we just now know more about it. Does that help? I mean, does that answer your question? So, the, I mean, the, the, if you want to know the instrumental answer, you want to be creative, quit thinking about being creative, learn how to do your job. <laughs> I, I suspect with advice like that, we'd be hard pressed to have uh, uh, any better questions. I know some of the guests uh, have to leave very shortly, and I hate to cut it too short, but there is a reception uh, immediately following in the undergraduate gallery, uh, a reception for Peter uh, Zellner's uh, hybrid uh, services book. And we should, uh, I think, all uh, thank the panelists for their